Welcome to the Smarter Science of Slim, the scientifically proven program where you eat more and exercise less to burn fat and boost health. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. All right, cool beans. Here we go, Lynn. <clears throat> Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. I know today's show is going to be action packed. It's it's a good show. We've got a wonderful, passionate woman, author, speaker, holistic nutritionist who's been out preaching and telling people that, you know, it's not just all about calories, folks. That's a myth. She goes way beyond that. She's been doing that for quite some time, literally tens of thousands of people. She's a best-selling author of the book, The Plan, and she is the executive director of nutrition over at a bunch of holistic nutrition centers all around the country. She's doing good stuff. She's helping people live better. Lynn Janae Recitas, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Lynn, let's before we before we dig into the science, which you and I both know and love, how did you get started on this this what some people call controversial? I don't think it's controversial, but some people think controversial path. Well, you know, I started off uh, just like a regular traditional nutritionist. I believe that healthy foods made you healthier and made you lose weight. But in 2007, I opened up a holistic health center. That was important. But really, I think the most important thing in advancing my career was a BlackBerry, believe it or not. Uh, what wound up happening was that people that I would traditionally just see once a week or once every two weeks or once a month, I encouraged them to email me daily. And when they started emailing me daily and sometimes hourly, I could start to track their symptoms to foods. And I noted that certain healthy foods like black beans or salmon or Greek yogurt or oatmeal would not work for 85% of my clients. Now, here's what's interesting. If you don't change the caloric value of a day, you shouldn't gain weight, right? So I have people steadily losing weight. They're losing tons of weight, and all of a sudden I introduce one food, and I would see two-pound weight gain. Now, how is that possible? But not only would I see this huge weight gain, say, to asparagus or strawberries, but I would also see an amplification of whatever was in their physiology. So if you had migraines, you would have a migraine that day. And if you had arthritic pain, your arthritis would flare up. And if you had digestive issues, your digestive issues would flare up. So I, I started to track all of these allegedly healthy foods and started to notice, wow, 85% of the people react to this and 70% of the people react to this. And then we almost call it the Las Vegas School of Nutrition here. We're working with odds. Right? We've monitored hundreds and thousands of people's responses to foods, and we found out which foods are, seem to be universally low inflammatory and which ones that are healthy have a higher risk of being inflammatory for you. And that's really how the plan started, just tracking data. Lynn, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what resonated with me so much about your work is your message of I'm not going to sit here and say, this is right, this is wrong. I'm going to say, try it. How do you feel? If you feel like garbage, it's probably not something you should continue. And if you feel good, it probably is something you should continue. Whereas we traditionally hear there's healthy foods and unhealthy foods. And that's the bottom line. You know, it's funny you say that because I had an article come out in More Magazine a few years ago. And I called oatmeal the devil. And I literally received hundreds of emails a day saying, thank you for saying that. I always felt like garbage after eating oatmeal, but I forced myself to do it because my doctor said I should do it, or I read in this magazine it was healthy. And my body, just like you said, was talking to me. When you feel badly after eating a meal, that's your body talking to you. And it talks to you in many ways, whether it's your mood or the way you sleep or your hot flashes or your digestion, but it will always talk to you in your weight. So you want to find these foods. Really, ultimately, the plan never started off as a weight loss plan. It just started off to make people feel better. But we just noticed when we started to identify the foods that don't work for your unique chemistry, you would also lose weight eating a lot of food, 
never starving yourself and feel amazing all the time until, of course, that trigger healthy food is introduced. Lynn, I don't want to get too metaphysical here, but this seems like it almost seems like there's a there's a, a, a issue with human nature going on here because it's what what you're saying seems so commonsensical. If it makes you healthy and feel good, it's good for you. And like that true, like how could anyone ever argue with that? But that is not we're not told to eat what helps us to further our goals. We're told eat low fat, eat low carb, eat vegan, eat paleo. Like there's, there's always some other thing we're told to do other than eat the foods that make you feel and look great. Well, that's, that's great. And let's discuss this because you have to remember not many people are going to take the effort to work with an individual on an individual basis. And and that's what, that's what I did. And uh, it's a lot of work. And many doctors and many people in the medical establishment just don't have that time. It's where a healthcare system is set up. And so if somebody finds, if you're doing research, you're a researcher, and you say, you find that, say, blueberries work for 70% of the population, you're going to say it's healthy, right? Because, hey, 70% is a good number. But what if you're the 30% it doesn't work for? And so here you are plugging those blueberries in, not knowing that it's causing this huge inflammatory response. And remember, 70% of our immune system is in our digestive tract. So if we're plugging those blueberries in daily thinking we're doing the best thing for us, eventually we're going to start to affect our immune system. And Lynn, what what I also hear you saying is it's not, so I I could imagine someone listening to this and saying, okay, great. There's no such thing as like nothing is good or bad. Everything is completely up in the air. I'm so confused. That's, I, I don't think you're saying that either. What you're saying is certainly there are guidelines and certainly there are things which really 99% of the population is going to struggle with. So you're pretty safe just steering away from those. And there are these other things that 99% of the population will probably be fine with. So you're probably good focusing on those. But then there's this swath of stuff in the middle, which if you do a web search, you get 500 blog posts saying that it's the best thing ever, and you get 500 blog blog posts saying it's toxic, they're probably both right. It depends on the person. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, in the plan, what we do is the first three days, we put in the least inflammatory foods. And literally, uh, the testimonials that I have from people that have read the book and have done the plan just on their own for $15, they've changed to their life and their health. It's pretty awesome. But um, so yes, they're the universally low inflammatory foods are in those first three days. And then we slowly start to introduce foods based on, on the lower inflammatory aspects. For instance, on day four, we'll test goat cheese because we'll find that goat cheese is lower inflammatory cheese and everybody loves cheese, right? So you want to bring in that joy factor as soon as possible. On day six, we'll start testing new animal proteins or vegetarian sources of proteins. But on those, we're using the least inflammatory out of my research. So we're keeping the body healing, right? We're reducing inflammation, which if you lose to, I mean, if you need to lose weight, that means you're losing a lot of weight too. And you're feeling amazing. And you're just introducing that one food. But yes, certain foods really work beautifully for some people and really poorly for others. And uh, I have people say all the time, oh, I can see my friends eating this and they're doing great and they're in a great mood and they're losing weight and I eat it and I blow up like a balloon. What winds up happening is when you do that, you start to have this fear and distrust of your body. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring that trust back. Your body's just talking to you. Your, your knee shouldn't hurt, right? But how often do you just go, oh, my freaking knee, my knee sucks. That's, that's prob- there's probably a, a reason for that, and it's probably the foods that you're eating. Lynn, uh, this in and of itself, we we, we got to have you back on the show because I, I think there is there is some deep philosophical you, – you probably got this plan for your future books. But like you, you talk about you have clients which talk to their friends, and their friend does X. And like X works great for me, and then the, your client tries X, and it works horribly for them. It seems like health – you could draw an analogy to happiness, right? That like I cross stitching or whatever the heck that's called crocheting. There we go. Crocheting might make me very, very happy. 
it might bore the heck out of you. So is, is crocheting a good or a bad way to be happy? I mean, lying, you know, like lying to people probably makes everyone sad. And like, but there's these things which it just depends on the person. Like, let's stop arguing. <laughs> well, you know, you bring up, there's, there's a couple of interesting things that you're bringing up. One is that, yes, we can really start to have this disconnect between, as, as I say, the brain in your cranium and the brain in your stomach. And what winds up happening is we start losing touch with the rest of our body. And uh, we start to intellectualize too much. Mm. And, and you can, and certainly that's fun, but if you're going to intellectualize, then you really need to know the chemical process of your body. And if you don't, it can be really, really frustrating. And every single client that I've had has said, I had a day where I thought I ate the healthiest food in the world, and the next day I step on the scale and say, how the heck is that number there? Literally, how, is that, how did I gain two pounds eating the healthiest food? So I get upset, and I spend the day eating cookies, and then I stabilize. Well, maybe I should just go on the cookie diet and be happy, right? Well, obviously, cookies long-term are not going to work for your health. But what we've found is, is that when you eat a food that doesn't work for your body, what winds up happening is that there's a huge histamine response, and that's that automatic water weight gain that you have. But you should be able to lose water weight, right? How does it stay on as long-term weight? Well, what winds up happening is when you eat, say, those strawberries, and they don't work for you, after that histamine response, you have a heightened cortisol response because your body thinks it's under attack. Now, we all know that cortisol long-term can increase fat storage, right? But what a lot of people don't realize is that cortisol and our hormones really come from the same place. So when you have those heightened levels of cortisol, you're also skewing your hormones. And for most women, that means it's going to shunt progesterone and in men, testosterone. And what winds up happening with that is we start affecting our thyroid. Great. Well, now there's long-term metabolism. Those hormonal fluctuations are going to affect our yeast. Well, great. Now we're poochy and bloated and have awful PMS and awful mood swings. And then those long-term uh, effects will start to really affect our immune system because, as we said, 70% of the immune system is in your digestive tract. So every time you're eating whatever food it is that you think is healthy and you're plugging in and it's not working for you, you really start to go through this really awful domino effect. And it's really amplified over the age of 35 because as we age, we lose digestive enzymes, we lose stomach acid, even our saliva decreases. And that's why people will say, well, I used to go on this diet when I was 20, and I felt great. Why isn't it working now? Well, great. There's another reason we're not trusting the process of our body, instead of just understanding what's happening. So the, the, the mood thing is very important, because that cortisol is also going to heighten that stress. And so, yeah, you're feeling miserable. Lynn, how have you found the most success, because there, there's, there's a psychological issue here too, obviously, what you're hitting on. There's, there's a lot of biology going on, but there's also just the psychological issue of trusting your own body. How, how have you been able to help your clients do that? It is so amazing, and it is so joyful when somebody says, you're right, I realize calories mean nothing, and my scale is my best friend. Because what winds up happening is all those times we're subtly beating ourselves up for either the creaky knee or the migraine or the depression or the weight gain and realizing when I plug in the right foods, I feel amazing. That's putting you in charge. And we, we so live in a society where it's like, oh, you're, you're getting old, suck it up. You know, that's just part of the process. Depression, that's, hey, you're stressed out. Hey, you know, that's what happens. You have a stressful life. Not knowing that these foods, that when we understand how they make us feel and we choose to have these foods in our diet, that we feel better. And, and what I'm saying is I don't want you to become vegan or paleo or macrobiotic unless you want to. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do is I want you to test the foods that you love. So if you find that the turkey burger doesn't work for you, and there's a good chance that it won't because turkey's 85% reactive, and the beef burger does, 
and there's a good chance that it will because it's about 8% reactive, then go for the beef burger. Well, that's not a diet, right? That's just making a better choice. If the black beans don't work for you, well, black beans are high reactive, but lentils are low reactive. Okay, well, that's not a big, huge change, and it works better for my chemistry. So, Lynn Janae, you made it. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, you made such an important distinction in there that I, I really just want to focus on for one second because the distinction of if you want to be a vegan, that's fine. If you want to be paleo, that's fine. If you want to be low carb, that's fine. If you want to be low fat, that's fine. But you would encourage people, as would I, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if that's what makes you feel good and accomplish your goals like that's why you should do it. You shouldn't do it because it's right in quotations. You should do it because it enables you to reach your goals. Yeah, we, we're really. Uh, I I I don't know. People say all the time, "What should I eat?" I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the faintest freaking idea. Outside <laughs> of those first three days of the plan, I don't know what you should eat. I don't know what's healthy for you. But what I do want you to know is, I want you to be able to determine your physiological response to food. And if food makes you gain a, a little bit of weight, but there's no accompanying physiological response, I want you to eat it if it makes you happy because you can always lose weight. It's only when we have inflammatory day after inflammatory day that we start to uh, have our health and, and our weight uh, go in a, in a down spiral. But what winds up happening, and there's some pretty interesting things when you eat foods, and, and remember, everybody's unique, right? So we, we find with some people that when they eat an inflammatory food that it will cause their leptin levels to rise, which means that they're starving. Or with some people, the food's so inflammatory that sometimes serotonin levels will rise and they'll have that, that feel-good feeling, right? So what we want to do is we, we want to, or, or if you're eat, not eating enough nutritious food, let's say you have lunch and let's say you just have a salad with some cucumbers and tomatoes, your bodies go, you know what, there was no B12 at lunch, there was no iron at lunch, there wasn't enough fiber at lunch, you're still hungry. Right? So a lot of times we can't really, when we're new to this, say this food makes me feel good, I should eat it. And that's why we say that starting with the cleanse, what winds up happening is that body rapidly wants to be on that path to health. And then test the foods that you love. But we need to go through this sort of cleansing process. And, and remember, during that three-day cleanse, as a woman, you're eating over 7,000 calories, and as a man, over 8,500 calories, but you're losing anywhere from 5 to 10 pounds, which is pretty cool, right? And then slowly test the foods that you love so it doesn't become Lynn plan, but it becomes your plan, and it becomes something you can sustain for life. Lynn I don't know how anyone could really disagree with the, 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 the plan, <laughs> the idea of saying... If it makes you feel good, you should do it. And if it makes you feel bad, you shouldn't do it. But sadly, that that element of common sense seems to be missing a bit from some aspects of the nutritional dialogue, which which is unfortunate. And I appreciate you for reminding us of it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And I, you know, I mean, I have to say, I I was mystified when I was gathering this data as well. How can walnuts trigger migraines, acid? I mean, I couldn't believe the things that I, were fi I was finding on a consistent basis. It just, like people say, I feel like I've entered bizarro world. I have, <laughs> no, I have no idea of what's going on. But it's fine because you know what that does? It makes you tune out everything else and turn to back into your body. Well, and Lynn, yeah. while, it is, while it is mind bending in one sense, uh, in another sense, we all intuitively get this. Like we know there are people who have a peanut allergy, for example. So like peanuts conceptually could be fine for someone and kill another person. Right. So, so it's like exactly. we get, we, we just, I think people are only starting now to understand that, okay, yeah, peanuts are fatal to some and just fine for others. There are myriad other foods, which are probably not that extreme in their, uh, the variation in the metabolic response they cause in the body, but what if more foods than just peanuts needed to be thought of in that way? 
Right, and that's exactly it. And I actually use the, the peanut uh, analogy a lot because when people will gain two pounds from tomato sauce and they get mad at their body for doing it, I, I say, well, look, you, people that have a peanut allergy don't go, get mad at their body for going into anaphylactic shock from having a peanut. It's just that's, that's your chemistry. But find something else. But even when you're talking about just ethnicity, I mean, it's, it's very common knowledge that Asians and African Americans don't do well with lactose. But Northern Europeans have built these enzymes over generations and generations because it was a primary food source for doing well with dairy. Uh, it's common knowledge that the people with the highest incidence of fish allergies are the Japanese because it's overconsumption. And the highest incidence of sesame allergies are people of Middle Eastern descent. So, you know, the, there are many reasons why a food may or may not work for, you know, your unique chemistry. And you don't need to overthink it unless you want to. And, you know, <laughs> being a science geek, I think that's, that's super fun. But all you need to do is to know, look, every time I eat pork, I feel creepy. I gain a pound. I'm not going to eat pork. It's not rocket science, you know? Lynn Janae, this is wonderful stuff. We didn't, I have notes here. We didn't even touch on. So we're going to have to have you back on the show, <laughs> but I know you're a busy woman. So I want to wrap up here. What, what's next for you? What's next for you? Well, uh, we, we're working on some exciting things. We're having a cookbook come out. You know, we're, the plan's all over the world right now. So I'll have people in Indonesia or India or Thailand saying, can you, can you please make food plan-friendly for my cuisine? So that's super fun. And, of course, we have uh, lots of people saying, can you please me make Mexican and lasagna plan-friendly? So we're going to do that. But we're also working on a thyroid book. Um, because we find that easily 85% of women have thyroid dysfunction in their 30s. And by uh, the time a man's in his 50s, his thyroid dysfunction rate is just as high. And we're also uh, doing for exercise what we did for food. And that's showing how certain types of exercise can be inflammatory for your body. And most people that are exercising uh, are, are doing so in a way that's affecting their thyroid and their metabolism negatively. So exercises like CrossFit and boot camp and spinning can actually be pro-inflammatory depending on how your body deals with that oxidative stress. So that's, that's kind of fun. That's what we have up in the air right now. I love it. Lynn Janae, I appreciate you for bringing this, this sense of self and, and self-trust back into the nutritional dialogue. It is, it is so important. Got some compassion there as well as some chemistry and that's a wonderful combination. So thank you so much. My pleasure. It was great being on your show. Listeners, we have been talking to, and I truly hope we get the opportunity to talk to again because we got to dig into that exercise thing. You know, I'm a fan of exercising less but smarter with Lynn Janae Recitas. Now, not only is her name very fun to say, but it is not at all spelled the way it sounds, at least in my world. <laughs> so you can learn more about her at her website, which I will spell out here for you. It's L Y N G E N E T dot com. Lynn Janae Recitas, and her book that we talked about today is The Plan. Easy enough. Folks, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did, and please remember this week and every week after. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Chat with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. You can get fabulous food same recipes over at carrybrown.com. And don't forget your 100% free eating and exercise quick start program, as well as free, fun, daily tips delivered right into your inbox at baylorgroup.com. That's B-A-I-L-O-R group.com.